Hi everyone and welcome to the recording of our next Tuesday talk about planting and trees as part of the autumn programme for redesigning Grosvenor Square. I'm Natalie from Make Good and we've been working alongside Grosvenor to make sure people have the best opportunities to get involved in the project and influence new designs. When we set out to redesign Grosvenor Square, we knew we wanted to do this with our neighbours and with other London communities, bringing together the best knowledge to create a new type of urban square which encourages discovery and fosters well-being. Our aim was always to create a shared vision between Grosvenor, our local and London communities and the design team. We have used the feedback from our summer exhibition where we tested initial design ideas to shape the developing design ideas that we're sharing and testing with you in this exhibition and through a programme of events this autumn. The exhibition in the square is now finished, but you can still see all of the information online at grosvenorsquare.org. Of the six key sets of information that we are sharing and testing about the developing designs, a very important one is planting and trees. You told us you were excited to see planting to delight the senses, provide more natural planting with variety of trees, seasonal change, and that could invite and support wildlife. As part of the autumn exhibition, we created a temporary planting installation to help us spark this discussion, and this will be up in Grosvenor Square until the middle of November. I'll now hand over to Nigel Dunnett from the University of Sheffield. Nigel is part of the design team and one of the UK's top experts in all things planting and biodiversity. We're really lucky to have him on board. Nigel delivered an inspiring walk and talk for us in the square on the 13th of October. This is an abridged version of the talk and unfortunately due to the social distancing measures and safety guidelines, we are unable to record the question and answer sections of the event from the audience. We would also like to apologise for some technical issues in the quality of this recording. If you would like a transcript, please give, get in touch via our website, grosvenorsquare.org. So I'm Nigel, Nigel Dunnett, and I'm part of the design team um, focusing on the horticulture and ecology and planting. And so I'm going to say a few words about that. And of course, as Natalie said, the idea was that we do a bit of a walk, but um, right on cue, the, the weather has changed, although it's supposed to be quite showery. So I don't know how many of you have been listening into some of the talks that have, that have been going on, but I've been in some of those, so I don't really want to repeat um, some of the things I've said. I think this is more of a chance to um, introduce some ideas, but also to um, answer any questions or any concerns or any um, suggestions that, that anybody might have. I think the most important thing to say is that really no decisions have been made at all. But you know, the, the design ideas are developing, but that's what they are at the moment. They're, they're developing design ideas. And certainly with the planting, um, there, there, there really have been no decisions made about anything. Um, this is part of an ongoing process, and we're, we're really feeling our way towards the detail of that. So, um, the exhibition that you've seen is really about the character of the planting, the type of planting that, that might happen uh, and where that might go. But the detail of that and the amount of it and, and so on, really that's, that's still all up for discussion and, and input. So um, it, it really is genuine that these are um, discussion meetings and engagement and consultation meetings over the future of the square and some of you um, obviously know it really well because you, you, you live, live, live around here, a residence, and others of you have a real interest in the square. Just to briefly recap, um, the, the inspiration for me as the starting point, I suppose, is the heritage and the, um, the, well, the heritage and the history of the square as the starting point for producing a really diverse, really richly planted square because that was what it was. Uh, and what we see around us now, although of course it's, it's a wonderful place, it, it's not really, it's a, it's a tiny blip in the historical timeline. And if you look at the exhibition, you'll see the actual, the original square, and, and as it was in its early days, um, was mostly planting. That it was actually um, planted beds um, with strawberries, mostly, of, of this sort of type, not, not like this, but of, of strawberry beds. And most of the space was taken up by that. I mean, you have walkways and cars in between or a central square of lawn. But, but the real feature of it was the planting. And, and as you know, it was, um, it was quite radical at the time. The sort of um, idea of being a richly planted square with 
an informal character. Now, in in terms of the time, it was informal because there were curves and 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 kind of ovals and, and circular shapes, uh, and and that was as bad as daring as it got then in terms of being natural, as opposed to a very formal ge geometric uh, and angular approach that was that was of the time. So, so the concept of the wilderness, the wilderness work, and recreating, however abstract that was, the feel of the countryside in the city was uh, one of the first times it was done in London and around the world. And, and that's the heritage and the history and the tradition that I look back to, really, to try and recreate. And, and some of the early uh, descriptions of the square and the plant listings um, list a really wide range of plants, some of which would have been native, a lot of which would have been garden introductions at the time. Um, and, and I suppose if you compare that with what we have now, then, then this is a very different situation in that there's one main tree species, the, the plane tree, there's one main hedge species, the holly, and there's another grass layer underneath, and that's pretty much it. And then we have some little patches of, of more diverse planting and a few other trees in. But if you, if you let's say we, let's, let's call grass just one, one grass species, although there'll be several different ones. We've really only got three three different species of plant in here. One tree, one main shrub, and one grass layer. And that is so different to the, the heritage of the square. Um, and, and I think this, this idea of the wilderness, um, or bringing the countryside into the city, um, is such a, an exciting one, really. Because you know, if you go out into the countryside now, and you, you just look at the woodlands and the hedgerows, then they'll be full of fruit, they'll be full of hawthorns and rose hips, and old man's beard, the, the wild clematis, and mountain ash, and there'll be hazelnuts everywhere. And look around us here, how much of that autumnal glory is reflected in the square? There really isn't anything, of course, the plane trees turn a, a yellowy color, but that the splendor and the richness and diversity that, that we find in the countryside is not reflected anymore in the square. And of course there's something else about the countryside that is not reflected in the square anymore, and that's the wildlife, the, um, the diversity of wildlife. Uh, and that's because we have such a low diversity of plants. So, it's like, so, the, so the low diversity of, of plants, this really simple layering, um, almost automatically gives us the low diversity of, of other plants, and birds and mammals and invertebrates, not that we want necessarily lots of other mammals from there. Um, so, so that to me is a really exciting starting point, to, just as a way of thinking uh, about the square. And then to throw in, of course, the fact that we are in the time of changing climate, although it's maybe not the best day to talk about that, um, but the, you know, the protections, of course, are that, 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 that London will become more like Barcelona, really, in terms of its climate in 50 years' time, 30 years' time, and we'll, we'll get more and more glimpses of that. Now, of course, that, that, that's a nice thing to, to, to have, but that does mean that a lot of the planting that we, we have now, or we think about now, is just not going to be the planting for the future. So there's an element of thinking forwards and in the same way that these trees were planted as young trees in the 40s or 50s, and now they appear to be a mature tree cover, you know, we have to think about the future generations. And what we do now is what people in 50 years' time or 60 years' time will look at. So there's that thought as well. Uh, and I think the final thought is about the character of, of the square itself. And, this is something that's really been coming through loud and clear from the early days, that the, the openness and the calmness and the restfulness is something that, that, that a lot of people just do not want to see disrupted at all, because that's, that's the beauty of having somewhere like this in this part of London, that you can escape into this restful and, and calm place and, and, and relaxing place. Um, so, so if you've seen the, the exhibition, you'll know that, that a large part of it is to, is to try and keep this central open space in the lawns and the, the place for just sitting and relaxing and sunbathing or, or, or whatever. But then that gives us the opportunity to do something around the edges and to think a little bit differently than the, the holly hedge and the, and the plane trees. And 
and particularly if we look around the edges now, underneath those plane trees, um, it's not really walkable on a day like this unless you've got good outdoor shoes because it's muddy, there's no grass in places, it's, it's, it's really hostile for, for plant growth. And so even in the terms of open space and, and sunbathing or relaxing on the lawn, it's not working in places because it's just not really where you'd want to sit in the mud. So to, um, th this area underneath the trees is, is maybe where there's the greatest opportunity for, for doing some more diverse planting and that's what this, this, this planted oval is all about and um, we can talk a little bit about that. I should say as well that you know, I've done a lot of um, planting design work and, and my whole approach is, um, is an ecological horticultural one to mix uh, sustainability and ecology with horticulture um, to produce something which is naturalistic but not necessarily try to copy anything you find in the wild. So it's a little bit exaggerated or amplified for the visual quality. And there's a little bit of the, the sense that we've, we're trying to do here. Um, but I've also worked, uh, done a lot of show gardens and Chelsea show gardens and this really is like a Chelsea flower show garden because it's a, it's a complete invention, it's a completely artificial thing. It was, um, it was put up over the course of two days as, as you know on the lawns and everything is still in its, their parts and will just be taken away and it will be taken away because um, I think I'm right that planning permission would have been needed to have anything which, which was here for more than um, a month or two. So, so unfortunately this, this can't stay but it's just doing this really, it's giving a place that's enclosed that people walking by don't need to come into and somewhere a little bit sheltered. But part of the idea within the new gardens which you see in the, in the scheme is to have areas within um, underneath the trees that there might be opportunities to get together in a group or somewhere where there might be lots of edible planting around you could even forage for some things um, other more open places maybe other places where it's more, more playful um, to give a whole range of, of different opportunities and the, the planting will really contribute to that i suppose the planting here is is trying to do is trying to say several things and Firstly, it's really diverse. I, I don't know how many different plants we've got here, but there must be 50 or 60 different ones. Um, it's not diverse, just diverse in numbers, it's diverse in this layering. So we've got, we obviously haven't got big trees, but we've got medium-sized trees, small trees. We've got big shrubs and small shrubs, then we've got grasses, tall grasses, short grasses, and then creeping plants. So we've got that diversity, and, and almost automatically that, that leads to greater habitat opportunities for different um, A lot of these plants, I know some of you are really keen horticulturists and will, will know the names of every single one. Some of you may not may not recognise anything. Um, but, but a really important part of this planting is that if it was able to stay through the winter, it would probably look very similar in January compared to how it does now. There's a lot of evergreen planting. Um, so all these sedges and grasses, a lot of the shrubs uh, within here, they're, they're evergreens. That's a really important part of the ideas to feed in. That this isn't just something uh, like a summer spectacle. It will look really nice and, and really welcoming and fresh in the winter as well. And then there's a lot of um, plants with nice seed beds. So I can see grasses, the scanthus grasses, this euphorbia behind. So there'll, is that a bit of biodiversity? There, there, there's, um, there, there'll be a lot, there's a lot of seasonal interest with seed heads and, and stems and structures. And then of course there's, there's flowering interest. Um, I suppose there's a, there's a kind of other thing in here that some of these plants are quite tender. So there's maybe a more permanent framework and the opportunities for putting um, more tender plants in to, to kind of top up. Um, but a lot of these plants are quite they're productive and they've got storage to them and I think that's another really important part of, of what we can do here. Um, a big thing for me with, with gardens and thinking about planting is, is to try and move away from the idea that gardens are just ornamental or just decorative or just cosmetic but of course they do many many other things and I think if there are stories or if there are, there's more interest to them then that's always going to 
to well, add more interest. So there's quite a lot of productive plants here. So there's a, that's a lemon uh, tree. And unfortunately, it had some flowers on it, we did when we put it in, but no lemons. And I was tempted to get some and to hang them. <laughs> but but um, of course, citrus trees are, we were just talking about, I guess, kind of perfectly possible in, in, in London now, in sheltered places, but in 20 or 30 years' time, then in a sheltered flower like this, we'll maybe out in the open. We're, we're, we're getting a bit more Mediterranean. Um, I can point out the one with the tree behind, with the, with the brown fruit on. That's a medal. And I, I've, I've never eaten a medal. I don't know if anybody... That's <laughs> strange. Yeah, but they're, they're obviously they're an ancient fruit. Um, it's medieval, really, in this country. And um, you really have to, to let them rot before you, you start to eat them. But, but they, um, they have lovely white flowers. Um, yeah. The foliage is really nice. And quinces, for example, are similar, with even bigger flowers. And then they're really powerful fruit. So, so things like quinces and medlars, you know, beautiful little trees, but what an interesting thing to have. There's a pear apple behind there. Um, and that particular one holds its fruit right the way through the winter, really, until, until January, but, but edible. And that tree there is a pistachio nut, which again is perfectly possible now in London. And this beautiful uh, yellow bark tree, that's comfort. So that's the, and if you, if you crush the leaf, you can really smell the comfort smell. It's a relative, relative of cinnamon. Um, what else can I see here? I think those are probably the main edit. Oh no, they're so like thick. So the silvery bars you know, are thick. Um, again, perfectly possible in central London to grow those in the open, not, not, not just against the wall. But other things where, where Natalie is next to Natalie, that's a flowering dogwood, called as Cusa. And um, that, there are yellow, there are red strawberry-like fruits on that one. And, I guess that brings us on to another story here in that um, the flowering dogwoods at uh, Cornus, Florida are beautiful North American woodland edge trees and of course we have the, the American link here and as well as memorials with the old embassy there then that's another nice story to start to tell with the planting with the 9-11 memorial as well that, that's also something to really reflect more because the original planting was intended to, to really peak in September. I'm not sure if it really does that anymore, but that's something we could really, really say. And then there's real wind, wind track plants like the, um, the cherry behind, Prunus um, subatella. No, it's not, sorry. My, my brain is starting to lose the names. Beautiful, shiny bark cherry, which has small flowers, nice color, but then with the bark is, is so wonderful. So I think that, that's, that just gives a little hint of what we can do. And, and for example, um, I don't know what you think, instead of having the holly hedge, which is just one single species, well, what about having more diverse, more loose hedge? So you still have the boundary, uh, the oval, oval shape of the square, but, but we have a looser boundary, one, one which you can in places see through. So it's not like a dense barrier all the way along, and maybe other places it is. So as you walk around the edges, it, it, it reveals itself. And I think that's another thing to say, really, that um, um, part of the idea of the planting and the, the whole scheme is, is not just for people in the square, but also people who are going around the outside. So there's the outer edge, and maybe making something lovely for people to see if they're just going by in a car or cycling. Um, and and also to try and reclaim the corners. And I know that's happened in a few other London squares. But if you think about it, there are these corners with plane trees, um, really big areas of just hard paved surface, which are not really very positive. So could we push, push the green parts of the square and reclaim the turn the gray to green through, through the plant again, make a real welcoming entrance as well. So I, I think, oh yeah, I've just put out the tree there which has lost its leaves. Um, this, this one's through here. Um, this is the Katsura tree, the um, Circidifilla, the Japanese tree. And it just has a nice yellow autumn leaf color, but um, 
As the leaves turn, particularly at this time of the year, then they, they give off this incredible candy floss, caramel scent, which if you're standing here, you'd be aware of. It, it's really, it's a really strange tree because if you go and, if you, if you catch the caramel scent in the air, you look around for where it's coming from. And if you kind of know it's from there, if you actually go and try and smell the tree, you can't smell it at all. It's really strange. It's in the air, but it's not actually on the tree. So that's another interesting thing, isn't it? That you, you have a real sensual um, experience, not just what you see, but the, the whole sensual thing. So I think that's um, a little bit of a, an intro, really, using, using some of the things we've done here to try and explain the possibilities that are here. Um, there, there are two things I should have mentioned that the, 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 bound, the boundary is important for, of course, and partly it's the shielding for the noise and the traffic. And maybe it's getting less of an issue now than it was, but, but also protecting people in the square from the pollution from the, the cars. And, and that's why some sort of barrier or edge or boundary is really important. Um, but all the research really shows that, that planting like this, which is multi-layered and more diverse and wider, is going to be more effective at noise control, but also pollution control. So at the moment, you have the hedge was about a foot thick, but very dense. But if the planting is more like six nine feet wide and multiple layers, then that will have a similar effect, but will have also a effect. So it's something that we will definitely uh, ask to consider strongly. And um, I think another help with that, I'm looking to Tom Hart here, who's from Tom and Luba, the, the design team, is that potentially um, working with the landform and having slightly higher areas at the edges where the planting can also then be higher so that you really don't see in certain places you're not really aware of the traffic at all so the hedge is quite short at the moment so you can, you can it's really car height isn't it probably we've even thought about it, to keep the existing hedge and then have another one on the inside i think what we've discussed is that possibly keep elements of the poly hedge uh, in place but then replace it with other things so that it's more like a natural hedge, so that you have um, deciduous things, you have fruiting things, you have all sorts of other things. So it's less of a monoculture. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I think really retaining that sense of an edge and the, and, and the shape of the square, but but just the diversification of it um, is really what we were looking for. We I just um, I just uh, well I, I I'll repeat what you said for me. <laughs> It's just a comment here about needing colour, and of course this is all quite green, just because really it's the time of year. Um, and I think that's, that's something that always comes across about, about colour and, and um, you know, the sort of uplift, but also the calmness that colour brings. And I suppose I, I'd, I'd reassure a little bit on that, because I think it's very easy to fill, fill everything full of really gaudy colour. Um, and, and also, I, and I was very um, guilty of this when I first started out working with, with plants. There's also a tendency to throw as many different plants as you can possibly squeeze into an area. Um, I think the way I, I would like to work with, with colour and plants is to, is to really work hard with colour and to, to not have a all singing, all dancing kind of jamboree of colours, but to work really, really carefully with colour so that you have so, so it's artful, so, so it almost feels like you're coming into a, an art exhibition when you come in here through the experience of colour um, within this more permanent framework and, and that really is where the opportunities are underneath the trees. Um, I think particularly to bring some light into the shade and to use paler colours or, or whites as well as maybe hotter colours in the more sunny areas but I think the colour, you're really, you're really right, I mean that's, that is one of the things that I sort of said, you know, go to the countryside now and it's full of colour and, and vibrancy, but, but come here and, and um, it's not here and, and really, apart from the leaves coming off the trees, there's not very much change from, from month to month to month, it's the same sort of experience as all here, and I think um, you know, working underneath trees, that is such a, an obvious thing to be doing, to have sheets of, of daffodils and snowdrops and, and all the spring wild flowers um, uh, and then ferns and, and other things which carry on, and cyclamen at this time of year, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, 
So, so that's part of the of the idea, really, to, to work with the conditions as they are, and to work with plants that fit those conditions. And and the wild daffodils or bluebells or, or things you see in, in our, our own woodlands in the springtime. Well, why can't that be reflected in a in a garden square? Like I think your point about if you can find a, a seat near where the where the flowers are. Well, that's certainly something that that's, that's being thought about within the scheme, so where the, the shaded gardens or the, the more horticulturally diverse gardens will be, then there'll be a lot of seating around edges uh, of, of spaces like this. And so rather than having a, a, you know, some seats which everybody has to fight for, then there'll be lots of places to be able to, to sit. So the question is about replacing the plane trees and um, just to step back a little bit um, to what I said about taking a long-term view, and I think there's a bigger point here that um, because this is part of what we want to talk about, the trees. Um, opportunities like this don't come along very often where there's, there's, there's real momentum to, to make a change and there, there is funding available to do it and there's a willingness to maintain it. So I suppose the, um, the opportunity is there to, to really think hard about what's here and about the future and to plan for the future. And, and you're right, these are, these are what in forestry terms you'd call even-aged. They, they pretty much all plant at the same time. There's some older ones, I think, over there, but, but pretty much they're planted at the same time. So they have a limited lifespan. They're, they're obviously nowhere near the end of their lifespan yet, but at some point in the future, they will be. But also there is this issue that it's just this single type of tree, pretty much. And um, as you know, more and more trees are becoming susceptible to disease, diseases and the planes are one of them. So if, if we have a serious disease of plane trees come through, then that, that's really all the tree cover gone all at once. If we have a diversity of trees, then we're more resilient to any of those changes. Um, so I think this is a chance to, to, to think hard about the trees that are here and almost to go around every single one and say, are you, um, are, you, are you giving the value for the space you occupy? And I think for all of these plane trees within the square, the answer is yes. I mean, who would really want to, to even talk about taking these big plane trees? I mean, there'd be, there'd be protests anyway. But there are other trees that, that you look at them and you say, well, are, are, you, are you really doing the job here? And I can just look through straight through here and there are a couple of, of really misshapen and, and bendy trees there. The, the tree nearest to us, which is a nice big shaped cherry tree, flowering cherry tree, which is really the nearest one straight through there. Well, these do have a limited lifespan. It's probably getting towards the end of its lifespan now, although it's a really nice size and shape, but it's kind of coming into the into the square. So there could be a discussion around that to say, well, if we are thinking about maybe wanting to have a big open glade in the middle, well, that cherry tree coming into the edge, um, could we plant a new cherry tree somewhere else and maybe say, well, that's got a limited lifespan left to it. I'm not saying that's, that's even being talked about, but I, I'm just saying that's an example. Or, I don't know if you can see it through here, there's a Hungarian oak tree standing by itself on the edge, which is it's an oak tree. It's not necessarily native, but it's an oak tree. But if you know about oak trees, you know that, that um, the really beautifully shaped oak trees with, with, with tall stems, they're, 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 fo they're forest trees and they grow up because they're, they've got other oak trees or other trees around them. If you plant an oak tree in the middle of a field, then it just goes outwards and it becomes this, this spreading tree. And that's what's happened to that one. And if you look at it, it's actually really poorly shaped. It, it looks, looks unhealthy and it's got branches zigzagging all, all the way across. And actually it's a, quite a poor specimen. And I'm not saying that this has been discussed at all, but if you were really looking hard, you could say, well, actually, if we want oak trees for the future, well, and this is coming back to your point, the best way to do it is plant 10, let's say five or 10 young trees in a group, maybe in a space between plane trees and let them all grow up together and then thin them out till you eventually get one with a beautiful tall um, trunk. And, and you have to take a long-term view of that. That's a 20, 30 year process to do that. 
but you can only get that shape if you think about it now. Otherwise you end up with misshapen, kind of quite poor specimens. So I'm not saying at all that that's even been thought about, but you could say that that actually is going to grow into, into maturity as, a, as quite an unattractive tree, and, and can, we, can we do better? But I think there are some candidates, particularly around the edges, where they are really shooting outwards, they're, they're really misshapen, <laughs> or, um, and we can, we can maybe have a walk and look around them, they, they, they fall very low down, and that causes all sorts of potential damage into the future. So I think really from, 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 from what we've discussed um, to date and from tree surveys that have been done, there's a small number of trees that, that we could look at and say, well, actually, let's start again with these. And it's probably less than 10, probably five, six, seven. And they're really small, misshapen ones around the edge. There's a couple of others that you might say, well, there's a discussion to be had. Um, and I think the rest of the trees is about managing them and maybe opening the crowns or lifting up some branches just to let a lot more light in because, um, you know, as you walk around, it's like you said, there's, there's so much shade and um, the roots are so near the surface that the grass doesn't grow at all. And if you want to do things like daffodils and, and spring bulbs and so on, then just to let a bit more light into the square would be really beneficial. Partly that's that, and this is, this is, this is what's happened. Um, and it's a tendency really everywhere um, that you plant new trees in close to older trees and they just have to find their way or um, so again we can maybe see it through there there's there's this, this tree with the big um, pinnate leaves the, the the Japanese tree of heaven through there and there's another smaller one quite close to it and that really has gone in too close to that bigger tree that's just going to get squeezed out and again make it make a horrible shape so there could be a discussion about that to say, well, we keep the big Japanese tree of heaven, but that smaller one next to it, that really isn't going to, to have a long-term future here. I'm not saying that's even been talked about, but that's the, some, some of the discussions that, that could be had. Um, I mean, we could have a, a little walk around and have a look at some of those, those if, if, if you'd like, and we can talk about some of the issues. And then thinking of the future, um, some of the trees around the edges, they're walnut trees. Um, so, uh, really nice walnuts and that's the sort of tree that, that has a long-term future. We can have a, look, a closer look at this oak tree. It's really doing what I said, it's just, it's just throwing out branches because it's got the space to do it. But if you look up closely, you can see the main leader or the main shoot is not going straight up. It's actually veering off in that direction. And so if you leave this to, to grow further, this is going to be a really misshapen tree because it's not going to be a lovely straight stem. And so, um, you know, one, one thing, considerations in the space like this, let's say you plant, let's say, 10 oaks quite close to each other and just let them go straight up and then they, you can really train them into that shape. So I just emphasise that there has been no discussion about this, this tree and what might happen to it. But it's just when you look at them closely, you see that they're not perfect specimens. And, and can we take this chance to put perfect specimens in here? I think it's more aesthetic. It, it would probably just compensate with the root system, and, uh, but it's just the aesthetic aspect. I think, I think the, the, the slightly more serious issue is that um, as it gets bigger, you know, the, tree, the, the branches here are really at head height already, and you'd, you'd want to start taking them up, and that's when you would start to really see the, um, the lean and the shape of it. I think we we'll just maybe head over to this, this, this side of the square. So this is a lovely um, shape of a tree and I, I haven't been here when it's in flower but there has been a tree survey done here and, and this is um, maybe you can say if, if you have a different experience. This is wild cherry, the single flowered white wild cherry and it really is a nice specimen but um, in the tree survey that was done before this work started, it was identified as one that potentially can be taken out. And it's nothing to do with the fact that it's a bad shape or it's in the wrong place. It's purely that it's really at the end of its time. And it's been identified as a tree that probably has less than 20 years of life left and it's gradually going to deteriorate. So it's really one of these discussions that we have this chance to do something now 
And do you bite the bullet and say, well, that's only got a, maybe 10, 20 years left. Um, should we uh, do the work now rather than doing something else here and then in 10 years time you have to take it out and start again. So there's only a small number of trees that anything like this applies to. And I would say it's probably these two here where there might be that discussion and this is probably the only one that might be taken out for this reason. And that decision hasn't been made yet, but, but that's the reason that some, some decision like that might be made. And I think really this is the only large sized tree where that discussion might might be take place. All the others are like some of these trees on the edge. They're, they're really poorly shaped and are just planted too close to others. So maybe we can just have a look at look at a few of those. So I think this is um, some examples where these uh, these trees here, obviously, they're they're not very happy at all. They're they're, they're really not doing anything. Um, and so so when I think in in some previous discussions we've said well some trees will be taken out and immediately alarm bells start to ring, oh no, trees are going. But I think when you start to look at the ones that we're mentioning um, are not really worth coming out, then I think it's difficult to make an argument against taking them out. I, I know that uh, in some of our discussions with, with Westminster Council, um, you know, any removal of any tree regardless is, is seen as a negative thing. Um, but I really do think that when we have trees like this, it, it's far better to say, well, we're going to probably put in maybe a hundred new trees into the square to take maybe five out like this that are not really doing anything. Seems to be a, a, a reasonable compromise, but that, that, that discussion still has to take place. I suppose the other thing to mention is, is what I briefly touched upon, is the management of the existing plane trees. Um, so if we look at this one here, then it hasn't been that well managed recently. I, I, I don't know well, some of you may be more expert than, us than I am, but these lower branches, again, are sort of heading off congesting. Um, and so there, there is a need, really, for some quite serious arboriculture in here, just to lift some of the branches, to pin out some of the crowns, uh, partly to, to, to create a really nice shape for the trees, but also just to let more light in. And, and the reason we have this sort of situation underfoot is because there's just not enough light getting getting to the tree. That's why they're doing that. So these sorts of areas really are much lower planting, so it's a shrub layer, a herbaceous ground layer. And then where, where new trees might go in, then it's really where we have more open spaces, uh, where the light's coming down and where we can create more light. So the space in between these, these two plane trees, for example, and, and apart from where we might want to start to put in really longer term things in these groups, I think what we're looking at is a, is a medium to small tree layer um, to, to kind of put this, this extra layer in, a bit like some of the, the shape and size in the, in the oval, that, that layer that's completely missing from the square at the moment. We can't necessarily always look to the status quo and say, well, these trees must stay like this all the time because there, there will come a time, not, not, in a force, not in the short term, where something will need to be done about these. So rather than, and again, I think we've had the view expressed to us from the Westminster Council, the way that they would normally work is to leave trees to get to that state, so to, to almost get decrepit and then the tree will fall over and then you replace it. I think really what we would like to, to do is a more active succession so we don't necessarily get to that, that stage. Um, and it's more interesting, I think, for people to see that, that happening. So, um, but I think, I think this is why in the, in, the, in the emerging design ideas, a lot of the horticultural diversification is in places like this, because they're not really usable at the moment for normal recreation. And so this is a great opportunity to do something really positive. Um, and I would say as well about the trees, um, of course we can't excavate or dig down or make, make big, big new planting air holes. So a lot of that, this is why I think, in answer to the question, we, we won't be planting big trees underneath these trees because we can't and we wouldn't want to. So it really is about things like bulbs and, and wildflowers and herbaceous layer with small shrubs and those will really go into the, the spaces because we, we, we want to avoid the root place, the root, the root areas of the big trees and, and minimize the disturbance to them. So any deeper planting holes will be in the spaces between the trees. And what we would like to do and it's been done in London quite a lot, 
underneath plane trees is to put a layer of no more than um, 200 millimeters, six to eight inches of uh, organic compost uh, and then plant into that. So it's a really, um, or like leaf mold, a really sort of woodland type soil. Plant into that, the roots can then go down into whatever's underneath, but we won't be cultivating or disturbing or damaging the existing tree roots. Is it worth saying anything about that sort of maybe landfall interventions as well here? Yeah, I mean, I guess like one of the things we've been looking at in the trading garden is, uh, sorry, I, I need to speak louder, sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, one of the things we've been looking at in the trading garden is this idea of name of the topography as well. Can you still can't hear me? Yeah, because we can see that. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, in this sort of zone where you have the existing trees, we're looking at that as a shaded garden where we're going to be planting and they care about and it's to nature. And one of the things we can do there to increase biodiversity, also aesthetically make that more of an immersive experience, is play with the levels of that as well and have bounding, while still avoiding the root protection zone. So like kind of the layering you saw in that oval, you also have a layering in this zone as well, the topography of the landscape. Um, so that's how we're sort of thinking about it. None of that is really kept down at the moment. But the idea is that it would create an increase while also buffering from you know the city. So you have a series of layers of planting but also the landform before you get to a kind of central open. Sorry, I'm sorry, I tried my best. I, I, so, so the idea was that at the moment it's all flat and particularly where there's space between the trees to, to mound up in places so that there's a bit of variation and then maybe more planting can go on top of that. I, I really should just emphasise I think that um, there's no intention to make this dense and to, to, to feel enclosed. You still have all the sight lines but you just have much more of a, of a, of a beautiful experience and an experience that will change every day really because there will always, always be something different to, to find here. Just a layer of yeah. compost on top of the existing soil just to give us something to plant into because if we try and plant plants in pots into this you, you just wouldn't be able to because of all, all the tree roots. But also um, it's really compacted because of everybody and, and tractors driving over it so to have that looser layer on top to plant into allows us to do planting. But, but no more than 200 millimetres, 20 centimetres. It's something that I suppose from the horticultural side um, we're kind of almost insisting upon and everything we hear back from Grosvenor is that yes that's, that's, that's going to happen and um, I think what we're really saying needs to happen here is to have the equivalent of a head gardener who's, who's based here and and that's why in some of the, in the proposals there is a, for, a, a space for garden, gardeners' office and, and, and shared and tool, tool equipment place and even uh, a space for outdoor learning and, and classroom and horticultural activities. To have somebody based on site who can not only oversee the maintenance but also can be a public place for, for doing talks and leading tours but also just to be here all the time to, to speak to people. Um, I would also say I think it's really important as a principle that there is somebody here who's a, a trained and qualified and skilled gardener, ideally with a team, but also who, who, who understands garden craft, but also has their own sense of um, managing gardens for the future, who, who maybe have has some artfulness to them as well. So. Um, so, so Natalie said that these sorts of plantings need very much maintenance. Well, well, no, not compared to conventional intensive horticulture. But I don't think that should be seen as an excuse for not maintaining. So I, I would like to see Grover Square being a little bit of a beacon for raising the profile of gardeners and gard gardening because in our public landscapes that, that's really disappearing and the status of gardeners and all that skill and knowledge is, is really way down there now. So, this is a real chance to say that the gardens are really important and that those skills are really important. So we've, we've made this point and, and everything we, we, we have coming out from Grosvenor is totally supportive of that. And in fact, the scheme is, is putting the facilities in to allow that to happen. Yeah, look, we haven't pinned that down yet, but I think our current proposal is the northwest corner. We have discussed incorporating a garden in the shed and also storage. Um, and we see that as a way to engage the community. Wouldn't it be so good if you could go speak to your resident gardener about what you saw today? So we're excited about that, but uh, yeah, it's kind of the flux of the moment. My understanding is that's not happening, and I think that's a really important point. Um, 
I so from my understanding, I don't think there's a specific gardener, but it's looked after by the maintenance team. But I don't think there's a resident or one gardener. No, but so I think I just really finish here and, and, and say that a tree like this, which looks perfectly fine, is another one you might have a discussion about. Just for the reason that it has this fork at this point, and um, if you imagine this tree getting a lot more mature, and you have this, this, this fork at this low down, and I think you'll already see that, then that's just a, a, a complete danger of it splitting, and, and you'll, you'll have that, that, that danger of, of the tree splitting, but also that weak point that can get disease. So, when, when there is a discussion about individual trees, it's not, it's not a, light, a light thing that's considered. There, there are reasons that that say, well, actually, taking a long-term view, should we maybe take that one out now, but then use this space here to, to really put a collection of, of, of trees for the future into here that will add something positive. And I suppose there are similar comments as a couple of smaller trees. I think, again, they're both walnuts, maybe, on the edge, which are just really leaning out and they have this, this sense of being misshapen. And um, again, they're, they're just a discussion that they had around those, really. I think we've probably looked at, at one, two, three, four. For definite, I would say that, that these ones along the edge here could probably go. There's a discussion about that, that cherry tree, which we looked at, which is actually, actually on the tree survey that was done is marked as not having a long life left. And then maybe, uh, one or two of these ones on the edge here which are really leaning out. So I think those are the, are the ones that would really be considered. And then maybe there's a discussion about that oak tree, but I don't think that's a priority at all, that, that oak tree in the middle there. It's just a discussion about what is going, it's just veering off in, the, in one direction. And, and could you actually say, well, there's maybe 20 or 30 years growth on that oak tree, but could we plant some more oak trees elsewhere in the square that would actually have that longer term future um, for the square. So um, it's really just if, in case anybody has any concerns about tree removal, it's a very small number and we will be putting a much larger number of trees back in which will have a real long term future. We hope you enjoyed this snippet of the Tuesday talk on planting and trees. For more information and to view the whole exhibition content online, please go to grosvenorsquare.org. Thank you.